Hi, Jacqueline Timmer here, founder of the American Voters Alliance and host of the Main Street Podcast. Uh, today you're getting a uh, quote unquote dirty shot or you're seeing the kind of behind the scenes of the Main Street Podcast studio. I'm actually about to run out the door and board a plane and that is gonna be my life for the next couple months. So while I'm traveling with the team preparing for a documentary that we will be releasing, my time slot on USLA as well as TECN TV is going to be filled with my dad's podcast. My father is former Kansas Attorney General Phil Klein. He is a Liberty Law Professor and Director of the Amistad Project and the host of First Principles. So stay, stay tuned, listen in. It's going to be absolutely great. I'll be co-hosting a couple of those episodes from the road, but uh, take a listen and then Main Street will be back with you later this fall. Hi, I'm Phil Klein, and thank you for joining me again, where we discuss what it means to truly be free. And we've often said that freedom isn't complicated, but it becomes so in implementation when there are those who believe that the primary function of government is not to protect our individual freedom or to respect our intrinsic value by recognizing that God gave us certain freedoms that government does not have the authority to take away, but rather believe government's role is to keep us safe. And that trumps freedom. And that appears to be a conflict that we have in this nation. And I'm very, uh, these days, and I'm very pleased to have joined me now, a, a friend, uh, a colleague, former Secretary of State of Ohio, a national leader in many ways in discussing these types of issues that we face in our country, Ken Blackwell. Ken, it's great to see you, buddy. Always good to be with you, Phil. And thanks for joining us. Now, Ken, it's, it's, it's interesting because I, I, I believe that this comes down to a, a understanding of what you believe to be the primary purpose of government. And if you could articulate a little bit about what you believe that government's role is in modern society and what is it not, and are we getting it wrong today? Well, Phil, let me just tell you, uh, I grew up uh, in a family that was a Bible-believing uh, family. When my, my, my dad came back from uh, World War II, he came back to Cincinnati, and Cincinnati was a, a, a city that was struggling between its promise and its, and its practice. There were still vestiges of segregation, and we lived in a public housing community for about the first uh, seven, eight years of my, of my life. Uh, but my, my dad was a fundamental believer, uh, a high school graduate a, 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 and, a, a, and a reader. Uh, and he would have us read the Declaration of Independence, but he would focus on that second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. He used to say, you know, uh, that's a highfalutin way of saying any knucklehead should be able to get this. <laughs> that that, that we're, 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 we're all created equal. Uh, we're not equal in size. We're not equal in weight. We're not equal in income. We're equal in that God has invested in us human dignity. And, and, and what he wanted us to understand and appreciate from that second paragraph was that our human rights are not grants from government. They are gifts from God. There's not a government on the face of the earth that can give you your fundamental human rights. Government's obligation and responsibility are to protect those human rights. Yeah, and that, and that, that, document, that document, Ken, after all knuckleheads should get this, <laughs> that all persons are created equal. It says to secure these rights, governments are instituted, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So, that's a definition of government's purpose in our declaration. But, but, but we weren't fulfilling that in your father's lifetime. You mentioned he went and fought for a nation at war, risked his life for a nation that also in certain parts of the country said, you can't sit here, you can't eat here, you can't ride this bus, and you have to live over here. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, and look, we, 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 we were a family that were engaged uh, uh, across the spectrum from my mom's side of the family, my dad's side of the family. We were engaged in the advancement of the human condition. My, my, my dad was always fond of saying that the human condition isn't a spectator sport. Uh, you know, you, you, you have to act, you have to engage, or you will be acted upon. And if you want to have anything to say about it, you have to engage. But he was also fond of referring back to something that Lincoln said, when Lincoln said that we are not a perfect union, but we are a perfectible union. And that what we've seen in our nation's 245 year history is that the conditions of our country uh, we, we've, we've stood in the gap and we've closed that gap between the nation's promise and the nation's practice, but it's been pegged on the fact that great nations are not the products of great government. They are the products of good people doing great things together. Uh, and, and so that's why he was always saying, look, we're, we're not perfect. We, we haven't always gotten it right. But we have, in fact, working together, good people driven by, you know, good, good intentions have, uh, have, have infected change. And, and Phil, I've been blessed. I came out of that public housing community. I not only became mayor of my city, but I've gotten to travel the world. I've been in over 60 countries and I've watched how, in fact, and been able to compare how we as a country have been able to stand in the gap between our practice and our, and our promise, and we've made things better. That's the, that's, that is really the measure of a good nation. Well, would you, would you agree that, that essentially we are a flawed people gifted a divine promise? <laughs> well, absolutely. And, you know, and, and so if, if what you're looking for is the perfect person, that has never made any mistake, that has never exhibited any weakness, uh, when you find him, you point him out to me. You know, but and, and the same things go, uh, will go for nations. You know, we, nations are not perfect, but, but, but the one thing that we've, we've had is a, is a realization that there is a, a, a tension between the organized power of the state and individual liberty. You know, when you when you have organized power concentrated in the state, baro human bureaucracy start to run, and the the day to day lives of people. And what happens is that individual liberty is put at 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 risk. That's why we've put we've put such a a, a premium on the family and on 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 faith because. What we know is that when you have faith and, and families, you have the basis of the incubator of freedom. Families are the incubator of freedom. And, and you and I both know this, that what the founders understood and they operated off of a principle called subsidiarity. They understood that government closest to the people governs best. And that's why the most most effective governing organization is the family. So if in fact you destroy the family and you make those people or individuals who are or, or were a family more dependent on the concentration of power in, in, in government, what you see is what we now have been experiencing and that is the rapid growth and expansion of the welfare state, which is counter to the opportunity society that the that the, the that the framers and the founders and and all of us are working towards. Let me let me speak to two points in there and try to separate them a little bit. One one being the um, the the growth of governmental centralized power and mm -hmm. the role of government and also cancel culture. Yeah, because we're kind of touching on both. And initially, we, you know, you you quoted the founders. Ken. And there are some who would say the founders should not be quoted. I mean, many of the founders own slaves. Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, this nation, rather than confront the issue of slavery, danced with the devil and tried to create a compromise in our nation's initial constitution in 1789. 
believing that you could allow this evil to persist in a nation without that nation eventually coming into conflict with itself. They would say, let's reject all of that founding and not see anything of value there. And to look back there is really racist in and of itself. How, how, do, you, how do you answer that? Well, the, the, the way I answer that, it, it goes back to what I said. Look, the, 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 the human condition isn't a spectator sport. We are not a perfect people and we have not been a perfect nation. But, you know, we have become a better nation because people of goodwill have bounded together, irrespective of race, uh, ethnicity, uh, income. And we've, in fact, affected, affected change. You know, th that's why th the last thing in the world that I, I, I think we want are sideline quarterbacks or, or sideline sitters. Because if, if you don't engage... And and, and 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 move for change for the better. Uh, what you get is 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 a, is a stale status quo. And you know what Reagan used to say: "Status quo is Latin for the mess that we're in." And the only way that we're going, the only way that we're going to change the status quo is by good people doing doing great things together for the for the right reason. Look, you know, it, Psalms three, uh, Psalms eleven, verse three. It raises a question. If the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And it, let's put it in, 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 in our time. If, if the foundation that, that has made us in 245 years the most prosperous, the most re, re, you know, robust uh, constitutional republic in, in human history, if those fundamentals start to be destroyed or weakened, what shall those folks who understand what the genius of our system is, what shall you do? We have to be engaged. So we, how are those, what foundations are being weakened now and how? Well, one is, is that it would go back to Washington, you know, a, 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 a nation that encourages its people to, to be a moral people to 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 we have a nation that are that's rooted in the judeo-christian uh, ethic and, and 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 heritage uh so one of the things that gave martin luther king a moral power was that he in fact advanced the notion that this was these these principles were universal uh he was he was an opponent to moral relativism you know what we what we now see happening is that moral relativism or relativism is on the march. Those of us who in fact can, cannot allow for this, this relativism to, 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 to divide us, you know, and, and for us to be engaged in the, the political process of uh, division and subtraction, we in fact have to take, we have to take a stand. And so one, uh, we have to push back against this attack on the universality of human rights. And, which and, that, is and that, uh, that is a recognition that in logic and reason that moral relativism simply reduces itself to a struggle over power and who has power to assert their will and who does not power have power. And there's not a moral construct to say that exercise of power is wrong. That is improper because it diminishes other human beings. And in fact, that's, that's part of what cancel culture is, is it not? It, it is an attack on objective truth. Yes. In fact, they would say that objective truth is nothing but an assertion to control the minority, that it doesn't exist. And I've seen that. Um, how, how do you see it breaking out in our culture right now? It's, it's stunning to me, Ken, and I don't know if it is to you, where in this age of so-called tolerance, that we, have, we are creating one of the most intolerant cultures I've ever witnessed, with people identifying through identity politics, accusing people of having less rights or value than others almost constantly in our discussion. Oh, absolutely. Uh, what, uh, 
a lot of the viewers probably don't know is that uh, Cincinnati uh, is the home of Reform Judaism. Uh, and we have Hebrew Union College who headquartered in Cincinnati. And one of the early scholars of Hebrew Union College and, and a, a friend of uh, uh, Martin Luther King was, was uh, Abraham Heschel. Uh, and Heschel, uh, I, I, heard him, I heard him speak a number of times in the, in the home of L.V. Booth, who was a mentor to, to Dr. King and a, and a friend of Dr. King's father. Heschel had a, had a saying that, that it's always gripped me. He says, respect discovers the dignity in others. Uh, and, 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 and so one of the things that we, we are experiencing, you know, in 2021 in, in America is this, uh, this abandonment of respect for, 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 for others. You know, it, it is an abandonment of the, of the acceptance that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know, something that was structured by a bipartisan group of leaders in America and taken to the United Nations, all of a sudden, that universality of, of human rights is, is being destroyed by factionalism uh, and this, this whole notion uh, that it is, that it is we're, 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 we're not defined uh, by the essence of our humanity. We're defined by skin color or income or what have you. Uh, and that sort of division, as I mentioned before, is, is, is tearing away at the, at the unity of the nation, which has, which has been the, the, the factor in us overcoming uh, a lot of our, our weaknesses and, and deficiencies. And that, that heritage and, and those ideas are, you know, we've got kind of a humanitarian crisis on the border, but part of the reason is because those ideas speak to the human heart that you reach these shores, you all are treated with a, a value that is a recognition of our humanity. In other words, America's great heritage in these truths still resonates around the globe, despite the internal effort, it seems, to destroy those foundations. Um, let, me, let me ask you this, what would you say to a 20 to 24 year old black man who has witnessed and experienced racism, has lived in the urban core, has been segregated not necessarily by law, but certainly by circumstances, such as if there was a barrier to be able to participate in American society, to get him to reject this belief that the way for him to proceed in the exercise of his rights is to diminish the rights of a white man who participated in putting them there. Well, I, you know, I'm on the board of the World War II Museum in New Orleans. As I mentioned, my dad was a World War II veteran. Um, he came back uh, and, and many of his, his, his fellow soldiers, uh, they used to have reunions. I remember sitting in the living room and listening to them and they would, they would talk about uh, segregation in the, in the armed forces and some of the, uh, the things that they had to, they had to endure. Uh, but it was the fact that they were willing uh, to live beyond that moment in their history and understand that there was a higher power, a higher principle that they were serving. It gave them the more authority that when they came back to this country after fighting uh, Nazism uh, and inhumanity in the world, it, it gave them a greater voice uh, and more intense determination. So I would tell young people, you know, again, there, there, are, there are folks who have experienced way more than you have in terms of uh, dehumanization, uh, uh, segregation, uh, racism, uh, but it is that they never abandoned the, the moral authority by taking on uh, the the negative characteristics of the of of the <laughs> of the people who they claim that they don't like or who they claim are oppressing them. Martin Luther King, those those returning soldiers, they in fact rose to a higher principle. They understood 
that uh, that 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 you could affect change. And, and so it, 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 hate, hate never accomplishes, you know, ne hate never accomplishes hate. I'm going to say you know, Martin Luther King was not an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. No, absolutely not. He, 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 he spoke to the higher principle and, and I suppose, and you know, for me sitting here, um, you know, I was, I'm white. My parents are white. I did not experience racism I, I, ever in my life in a way that could compare to how many blacks in America have experienced racism. And so this might seem, some might say it comes trite from somebody of my race, but doesn't everything have to be seasoned with grace? You fight the idea, you judge the conduct is wrong, but judge not lest you be judged. Is there wisdom to be found there in our relations to one another as a nation? Oh, I, 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 absolutely. Uh, and, and again, we, we, we need to go back to, to the history. Do we think that the slaves conquered slavery by themselves? The answer is no. There were men and women of courage who never embraced the practice of slavery. There were men and women who practiced slavery, who in fact came to, to be enlightened and changed their heart and their ways. And they through community and community of effort changed America. That's how we in fact change America. And, and that is a, that is actually you you spoke it at the beginning about how we were founded on Judeo Christian values, and this belief that individual liberty and the recognition of government of individual liberty is a way that we respect the dignity of each and every human being, and if we exercise that liberty with responsibility while seasoning our relationships with grace, a great nation can be built, and we can reject flawed ideas. You know. I've, I've, I've come to believe that this moral relativism almost articulates, it's odd, that all ideas are created equal and people are not. When there are good ideas and bad ideas and ideas that must be rejected like racism and ideas that must be adopted and enveloped and nurtured. And um, are you seeing, Ken, an understanding in our youth today about what government's role is in this. You started out by saying in, in a conversation before we got on line here, that, that our founders restricted governmental power. And there was a reason that they did it. Uh, I, I want you to speak into that. And do you think that we are respecting the danger that is present when we foist all of our hope, all of our future into the hands of government? rather than into the hands of our free exercise of our rights. Look, young people actually take their lead from, from us, the, the, the generation that precedes them. Uh, and, and, and folks within our generation feel are becoming more and more addicted to big government logistics. Uh, and, and, and therefore, there is an expectation that, that, that government is all, and more government is always the answer. And that is why we've seen this rapid expansion, you know, just in the last year, uh, uh, in part due to our response, a responsible response to the pandemic. But now, under the guise of responding to the pandemic, there is an even greater acceleration of the growth of, of government. And there is this false expectation that government is the solution to all of our problems. Uh, and, and, and what we need to do is to have young people go back and understand that we have spent trillions and trillions of dollars to, to, to fight poverty through and, and marginalization through the expansion of the welfare state, and we have little success. Where we have success is when we, in fact, give people hope, and we have give them 
a sense that they are in large measures the architect of their future and, and, and responsible for their own forward movement. That is that that's that's what's at stake here with the, with with our, our, our generation. Uh, if if we if if we basically say, you know, we're going to do away with all student debt, you know, that we're going to, you know, that that one one size uh, fits all health health care, uh, you know, single payer health care systems. All of a sudden, what we what we will find is that we will strip ourselves of the sort of economic growth that is that encourages uh, empowerment of individuals and, and families. And so, Phil, look, I, I, I think we have a real responsibility. Uh, you know, I, when I was <laughs> coming up, I, 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 was, I had the mumps and my grandmother, who was a domestic worker for four families, used to bring me books that she had gotten from uh, the families for whom, whom she worked. And, and, and one time I was reading this book, of, a novel about a little boy in the, in the 20s, who in fact uh, had, had a lot of time in the infirmary. And, and one night the nurse came into his room and he was standing by his window and he was looking out. And she said, little boy, what are you doing? He said, I'm watching the man walk down the street and punch holes in the darkness. And she said, what are you talking about? And she walked over to the window and she looked out and what the little boy was looking at was the lamp lighter going down the street at dusk, lighting the lamp. And in his mind's eye, the little boy said he was lighting, he was punching holes in the darkness. Well, you and I know from our, our embrace of the Bible that we are told in John 3 that those who would do evil love the darkness. Uh, and we're also told that we're to take our light that God has invested in us and put it on the candlestick. So look, we as a generation cannot allow this upcoming generation to live in the darkness of unenlightenment and un 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 uneducation or dis miseducation in, 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 in believing that big government is the source of individual liberty. Big government is a threat to individual liberty and we must light candles. We must show them through our own action that we're going to help them and they will help us punch holes in the darkness of our time. That's how we're going to defeat this, this accelerated growth of, of, of big government and its threat to our individual liberty. Uh, we're, we're, not a, we're not an accident. We are an intentional example of the world that freedom works and that the moral framework that we, our country was, was, was founded on gave us the wherewithal to change even the bad ways of the nation like, like slavery. Beautifully said. I, I, I appreciate that, Ken. And, and I, I, uh, I wonder where America's hope rests today. You know, I've often thought that as I've witnessed campaigns that they have become about um, uh, false hopes, that they've become about promises that government cannot deliver, and as well as demonizing the opponent rather than dealing with the significant issues of the balancing of individual liberty. I, I, I heard a talk by... Uh, I don't know if you saw the address by President Biden regarding COVID recently, mm -hmm. but he ended that address by speaking to us. And what he spoke to us was about hope. But I think he spoke to us and inferred that hope is found someplace else than whether you and I believe it was found. And he ended the conversation this way, something along these lines. He said, I need your help. Uh, I need you to wear your masks. I need you to socially distance. I need you to take reasonable steps so that government may deliver on its most significant role to you, to keep you safe. Which I found fascinating because here he is appealing to the individual to exercise their freedom with responsibility so that government can deliver something to them. I don't know if he caught that juxtaposition 
at all. But he said that government's primary role was to keep us safe. And I've often thought that freedom is really one of the most fundamentally insecure places you can find yourself. <laughs> so, so what would you say to the president or how would you address the nation about our role to join together in this COVID environment while protecting the real role of government? We you know, uh, <clears throat> Coming out of the 90s, I used to always converse with, with, with Newt Gingrich and, and, and some, some others. And, you know, we, we were always fond of saying that uh, freedom works and nothing works like, like, like freedom. But, but with, with, with freedom, you, you, you have to, it comes an element of risk. Uh, and um, I, I make a a long story as short as I can. I had a great uncle who you probably never heard of. His name was Dehart Hubbard. My uncle Dehart was the first black American to win an Olympic gold medal in an individual event in track and field. Really? What he, year was that? That 1924. Wow. And in 1924, he was to run in three events in Paris, uh, the high hurdles, the long jump and the hundred yard dash. He had a transatlantic debate with Eric Little as to which one of them was the fastest human being on the face of the earth. And when he got to Paris, he was told that the high hurdles and the hundred yard dash, even though he had qualified were white only events and he couldn't compete against Eric Little. Well, Eric Little, as you know, chose not to run because it, it, the finals fell on a Sunday. Well, my uncle said that God had blessed him. He won the, set the world record in the long jump, won the gold medal, but he said God had blessed him by, by allowing him to see the example of Eric Little and Eric's fidelity to, 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 to faith. My uncle came back to Cincinnati and he was one of the founders of the American Negro Baseball League and he had a great relationship with Satchel Page. Now this was a long way for me getting back to the answer to your question. Satchel Page was fond of saying that it was real difficult to steal second base if, in fact, you wanted to keep one foot on first base. <laughs> that there's a certain risk that you have to take <laughs> to, to, to have the freedom. You know, you, you, you can't be so scared of taking a risk of freedom that you buy into your own repression, suppression, uh, and, 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 and dependency. On, on government. Uh, and so what we have to do is to make sure that we help people to understand that freedom works, but you have to take the risk of defending freedom, that you, 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 you can't be so afraid of taking the risk that you, you become a keeper of your own imprisonment. Uh, and that's 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 what leadership is about. That's what being, you know, fully American is about. Is that we're 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 ready to take the risk to be free. And that's one of the great graces of God in our freedom is that we learn, grow, and and improve our condition with failure, the freedom to fail, and the freedom to learn. That's right. So, Thank you, Ken. I greatly appreciate your time. I, I uh, always enjoy our conversations. I look forward to doing it again. We need to have you on again and wish you uh, Godspeed in all your endeavors, sir. Right back at you, brother. Thank you. It is remarkable to me how recently in our culture it seems as if we have no grace, that people can make one mistake on the internet or make a comment and suddenly there's a culture on their back judging them and actually defining them as not having a pertinent part of the American promise. Yet, as Ken said, you know, such that his father said, any knucklehead could see it. We have to be able to see the good within the mistakes because we are all people who learn from our mistakes. And a, and a society and a culture that grows together is one that takes the risk of defending the freedom of others with whom you might even disagree. The freedom of speech, the freedom of thought, the freedom of 
of expression should never be under assault in a country. That defines the role of government as fundamentally protecting our intrinsic rights, respecting our inherent value by protecting our freedoms. Yet there are those who seem to be trying to fundamentally reorder the role of government in this country. And because of that, our freedom is under assault. It's not complicated. Any knucklehead can understand it. If you want freedom, you better stand up for it. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for staying tuned and listening in to First Principles with Phil Klein. Again, Main Street Podcast, my podcast, Jacqueline Timmer's podcast. We'll be back later this fall. Be sure to follow us on social media at AmericanVotersAlliance.org or any of our different social media channels, as well as follow Phil Klein, Phil D. Klein, at Phil D. Klein on Twitter.